Warning. Potassium hydroxide is corrosive. Wear gloves when handling it. Greetings fellow nerds. In a previous video I showed that silver could be restored by electrochemistry. Of particular note is this experiment where I restored silver using zinc metal but did it by connecting it through a nickel strip. The zinc metal oxidized releasing electrons that travel through the nickel conductor where they reduce the tarnished silver back into silver metal. But what if we break the conductor and force the electrons to travel through a load? We could harness the energy of the reaction to perform useful work. What we have just described is a battery. But let's take it a step further than that. In another experiment I showed you could artificially tarnish silver by driving electric current through it. And in yet another video I showed that zinc metal could be played out of solution by driving a current as well. So if we can both generate the silver tarnish and zinc metal by inputting electric power, and then get that power back by running the silver restoration experiment, we can get a rechargeable battery. In this video we're going to make the classic rechargeable silver zinc battery. So let's get started. First let's make our electrolyte. We get 80 milliliters of water and add in 24 grams of potassium hydroxide. Stir until it dissolves. You can also use cheaper sodium hydroxide but potassium hydroxide is preferred for batteries since it gives higher conductivity and thus better current. Now once it's all dissolved we add in 30 grams of zinc oxide. The amount of zinc oxide you use should match the weight of the silver metal you use for the positive electrode. Now we're using so much zinc oxide that most of it won't dissolve. This is acceptable since the zinc is played out as the battery recharges so the excess zinc oxide will dissolve into solution as needed. Now that we have our electrolyte let's make our electrodes. First we get a couple of nickel strips. These will be our supporting conductors also known as current collectors. And I selected them because under alkaline conditions they won't corrode. So I thought they would make very good collectors since they would always maintain a good connection to the silver and the zinc and never break down. Unfortunately I forgot that they have another property which makes them very bad for this experiment. They have low overpotentials. I only realized this when I got around to charging the battery which you'll see in a few minutes. So now we need a source of silver. The best thing to use is silver powder but I don't have any so I'm going to use my silver coin that you've seen in my silver restoration and toning videos. Anyway I folded over the bottom of the nickel strip so it holds the coin. Now we wrap the silver in a filter paper separator to hold it in as well as any silver oxide that forms and to prevent the negative electrode from touching it. All we do now is insert the electrodes into our electrolyte and there is our silver zinc battery. It's very easy to build. Now in this state it's actually fully discharged. It won't give us any power if we try to use it. So we have to charge it up first. To make this more interesting to watch I'm going to remake my electrolyte with just enough zinc to dissolve but not enough to precipitate out. This way we have a nice clear electrolyte so we can see what's happening. The battery will still work it just won't work very well. If you want to actually make your battery useful use the recommended quantity of zinc oxide. And here we are a fully assembled battery with zinc depleted electrolytes so we can see what's going on. I've also removed the filter paper separator and attached charging clips. Running without the separator is fine as long as I make sure the electrodes don't touch. The silver is connected to the positive lead of the power supply and the negative is connected to the other electrode. Now to charge it we apply 2 volts across the cell. And there we go you can see the silver metal darkening as it charges. So what's happening? At the cathode or negative terminal electrons are coming in and reducing the zinc ions to zinc metal that get deposited. This is exactly what happened in my video on making zinc powder by electrochemistry. At the anode or positive electrode we're removing electrons from the silver and creating silver oxide. This is essentially a massive artificial tarnishing reaction as I showed in my previous video on toning silver coins. Overall we're moving oxygen from the zinc oxide to the silver. I'm going to let this run for about 20 minutes to get nice thick layers of silver oxide and zinc metal. I'm not going to run longer because eventually the metals will get thick enough that they start to fall off. 
This is not a problem for a properly built cell that has a porous separator to physically hold the metals in, but for my demonstration cell that has no separator, the loss of metal means they won't contribute to any power that we may want to get back during discharge. Anyway, here we are, and let me take out the electrodes to examine them. And here is the positive electrode with the silver. You can see the thick black coating of silver oxide. We basically did our silver tarnishing experiment, but on a massive scale. Interestingly enough, we should also note the fine details are almost completely destroyed. This is not a coin anymore, just a disc of metal. This also illustrates that for coin preservation efforts, it's actually the tarnishing of the coin that does the most damage. The cleaning or restoration processes are the lesser contributors to coin decay. For some reason, there is a misconception among some collectors that the opposite is true. Anyway, let's take a look at the negative electrode. And we have a nice, loosely adherent layer of zinc metal. This is just like our previous video where we made zinc powder by electrolyzing a solution of sodium zincate. So now we have a small but usable charge on our battery. Let's take some measurements. Let me first measure the voltage. And it looks like we're getting an open circuit voltage of about 1.8. In practice, the working voltage is around 1.55 for silver zinc batteries. Now let's check the current. Oh, looks like we went off the scale. This is a surprise to me since I wasn't expecting so much current from such a small demonstration battery. I'm going to have to switch over to high current mode. On a side note, measuring the current directly by shorting the ammeter across the battery terminals is usually a very bad thing to do with proper commercial batteries, especially the larger ones. The current surge will at the very least blow a fuse in your meter. Anyway, let's see what we have now. And there we go, I briefly saw 2 amps of current before it ran out of charge. This is quite strong for such a tiny and poorly built battery. Let me roll back the video and I want you to pay special attention to the battery itself. The silver coin is actually being restored as the battery runs. The black silver oxide is being converted into silver metal. This is essentially the silver restoration reaction I showed in my previous video, except now we're running the current through our meter. The overall chemical reactions during discharge are just like the charging reactions, except now we're running them in reverse. Let me get the silver electrode out to show you. As you can see, the silver oxide has been converted back. Unfortunately, the restored silver does not restore the previously destroyed features of the coin. Okay, so now that we have a working rechargeable battery, what can we do with it? Originally, I thought it wasn't going to be too powerful, but if we can put out a couple of amps at 1.55 volts, then that's enough to charge a cell phone. Now a cell phone actually needs 5 volts. So we would need about 3 or 4 of these batteries to reach the right voltage. But there is a workaround if you just have one. There are these boost converter modules that can increase the voltage of a low voltage power source up to the 5 volts needed to power a cell phone. But in order to do so, they sacrifice current, so you need a high current to use them. The overall power usage is the same, so we're not getting free energy. The battery just drains much faster because of the higher current draw. Luckily, our battery is high current, so we can get the power we need. Anyway, let me first recharge my battery again for another 20 minutes. And here we are along with my cell phone with the power converter. Now we just hook it up, and the cell phone responds to charging. It'll only work for about a minute though before the battery runs out of power. Let me recharge it, and we can try again. And the battery does work again. Proof that we have a working, rechargeable battery, even though it's very weak and just lasts a minute. You're probably asking how we can improve this, and it's actually pretty straightforward. First, we use the full amount of zinc oxide we specified earlier, and for the silver electrode, rather than use a solid piece of silver like a coin, we instead use silver powder. Technically, we can still use solid silver, but we have to condition it by repeatedly charging and discharging the battery to destroy the silver and make it crumble into a powder. Now at this point, I should address what I meant earlier about the nickel being a bad choice of support metal. If you watch closely during the charging cycle, you can see bubbling of the electrodes. In addition to the desired reactions of depositing zinc and oxidizing silver, we're also getting electrolysis of water. 
Now zinc has a very large negative over potential for hydrogen, so the hydrogen does not form on it. But nickel has a comparatively small over potential for hydrogen, so hydrogen forms on the nickel and bubbles out. This is a big problem early in the charging cycle since it wastes power better spent on plating out the zinc. But as it runs, the zinc does get deposited at a slow rate and eventually the deposit is thick enough that it covers up all the nickel sites and the hydrogen formation slows. The more problematic electrode is the positive electrode with the silver. This time oxygen is a gas being formed. And while silver itself has a decently high over potential for oxygen formation, the nickel does not. So it generates oxygen gas. Wasting power better is spent unoxidizing the silver. It's more problematic than the negative electrode as the silver is not plating in or out of solution and remains solid as either metal or oxide throughout the charge and discharge cycles. So the nickel current collector is never covered up and continues to bubble oxygen, always wasting power. I admit I blundered big and totally forgot about overpotentials when I assembled this. Nonetheless, we still had charge buildup and we were still able to demonstrate the use of the battery. But if we wanted to build better, what would we do? The easiest method is to use solid metals throughout, no current collectors. We can do that for the negative side with the zinc, but silver is expensive, so finding cheaper solutions would be a good idea. The better solution is to use a better material for the current collector. In this case, graphite. Graphite has a very high overpotential for oxygen, actually higher than that of silver. So it makes the perfect current collector to ensure connection to the silver without itself participating in the chemical reactions. I'm using a graphite block clipped to the silver disc. The metal clip itself is separated by plastic so it doesn't participate in the reactions other than to hold everything together. Let me put into the battery. I didn't bother changing the negative zinc electrode because now that the nickel is completely coated, it's no longer going to generate hydrogen. Now we turn on the current to begin charging, and there we go. The charging is working and very little bubbling is happening. We're getting much more efficient charging this way. Understanding what materials to use to promote the reactions you want and suppress the ones you don't want is a huge part of battery research. It's also why a lot of promising batteries that sound great on paper don't translate into real life applications. They just haven't been able to solve a lot of the side reactions and problems. Now the next logical step is to make a longer lasting high powered battery by using powder electrodes with more surface area. But I'll let you know up front that I failed miserably. What I tried was putting zinc oxide along with a carbon electrode as well as silver powder in a carbon electrode in separate bags made of filter paper. Now I said earlier that I didn't have silver powder so I had to make some. The process was so interesting that I produced a separate video on it that I linked in the video description. Then I put the two assemblies in a beaker, hooked them up to power, and added the potassium hydroxide electrolyte we made earlier. The battery accepted charging and I left it there overnight. Unfortunately when I tried to use the battery it didn't work. It was even worse than before and couldn't charge the cell phone at all. I think this is because the powder is very loosely held together in the filter bag so it doesn't form a strong high current connection. In commercial batteries, the electrode powders are compressed for better contact and conductive fillers like carbon are added to improve connectivity. The battery isn't dead though, it powers a small USB monitor device. But it can't provide enough current to charge a cell phone. To improve the performance, I would need to find a better way to make the electrodes. Most likely by electroplating silver and zinc onto separate graphite electrodes. But that's another project for another time. I'll be honest though, I probably won't attempt to make a viable rechargeable battery because of the already well known problems with this chemistry. One of the big problems of rechargeable silver zinc batteries is dendrite formation. Basically, as you recharge the battery it doesn't deposit evenly. We already saw this issue in my video on making zinc powder. As you can see the zinc deposit in a bulge here. After many charge and discharge cycles the zinc would reach over to the other electrode and short circuit. The dendrites could even puncture the separators given enough time and cycles. At that point the battery would be inoperable and must be disposed of or recycled. So overall making a rechargeable silver zinc battery is not high in my priority list. Now you may be asking if these batteries are used anywhere. They actually were used a lot in the past being easy to construct and furnishing tremendous currents when properly built. For spacecraft and military applications their high performance outweighed their high cost. 
The fact that they were easy to recycle also helped to mitigate costs somewhat. But recent decades saw the advent of modern rechargeable batteries like lithium ion. With their more usable cycle life, they replaced the rechargeable silver zinc batteries in most large scale applications. Although you can still find them in smaller battery sizes. The non rechargeable silver oxide battery is actually still used a lot as hearing aids. And they are still occasionally used as emergency or standby batteries owing to their high power output and reliability. Also, being water based batteries, they can't spontaneously explode or catch fire. Anyway, there we have it. A simple but working rechargeable silver zinc battery. And using it we were able to recharge a cell phone for only about a minute, but we still did it. Thanks for watching. Special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for making these science videos possible with their donations and their direction. If you're not currently a patron but would like to support the continued production of science videos like this one, then check out my Patreon page here or in the video description. I really appreciate any and all support.